Hey internet friends, Grace here. I hope you're all doing great. This will be my first podcast episode. The last installation of this was really just the pre-game episode, but today is actually the first episode. I know a lot of us during our whole, hmm, what do I want to call it? Awakening, noticing, When a lot of us start to notice the grid of the matrix all around us, when we start to notice the very fabric of reality beginning to unravel, we look around for others who can see too. And unless you're really, really fortunate in your personal life or you live really, really far away from the cities, well, there's not many folks who can relate. It's isolating. It can be lonely. It can be really easy to feel disconnected. We can become bitter or hold contempt for others who are still caught up in the matrix. It can, well, honestly, it can be depressing. And at some point or another, maybe you've questioned your own sanity. So today I want to talk about how you aren't crazy. Society is. And how from the time when we're really small to the time we die, society does nothing but pretty much attempt to convince us of the opposite. Lunatics running the asylum style. Things have been escalating lately, but the storm has been brewing for a while. Let me explain. One of my big areas of work on this channel has been how our world treats children. From the shift of family first focus in our culture with mom being home to care for the children while dad was able to work and bring home a great income off of one job. Whereas nowadays, when it's less and less common, the, I mean, the typical expectation is that both mom and dad work, so two individuals per family can be taxed, instead of just one. Leaving a lot of babysitters to step in for the child. Babysitters in the form of daycare centers, screens, with all this programming aimed at a child's developing brain, and government schools. I say government schools instead of public schools because, well, that's what they are, Uh, compulsory schooling under a central government monopoly, a place where they warehouse children so they can mold them into warehouse adults working in factory or cubicle jobs. And okay, whenever I outline the goal of government schools, it it, it tends to upset people. I get some really upset comments and, um, you know, it's because they went to public school or they send their children to public school. And I just want to say, hey, I went to public school too. So did my parents and my my grandparents. So I, I mean, absolutely no offense I'm just trying to tell you where all the madness begins. Actually, it probably begins when you sign off on the birth certificate, but uh, where I have research in and where it begins, it begins here, the madness, like this expectation that children should sit silently at their desks without moving, squashing any and all creativity they once had and replacing it with this expectation that you must ask to do things from people who only have the illusion of agency over you. If you've been part of my channel any amount of time, you know the hill I'm willing to die on. You know the example I point to all the time. You know the exact moment that is written into all of our psyches where the programming, I believe the programming began when you have to raise your hand and ask the teacher in front of the entire class, hi, can I go pee? And the teacher is like, no, you can't. Sorry, you got to wait till the end of class. It brings up a lot of memories for me. Am I the only one who didn't have any good teachers in school? Do we all have this shared experience? I feel like raising your hand to go pee and being denied is total beginnings of the making of a villain. But... I was always that student who got all my work done without really ever having to try, just going through the motions until I got to college, which all of public school encourages you to do, when they really should encourage children to consider trade school jobs, which make a hell of a lot more money than my English degree ever would. But that's the formula for success, right? Be quiet. Be obedient, listen to your teachers, regurgitate this information, spit out these facts back at me, do well on your SAT, and go to college, get some student debt, and get a job in a big city, and start your life saddled with debt. 
That's what good, obedient pupils do, except for that boy over there who can't sit still through all class. He is constantly scribbling in the margin of his notebook and banging on his desk. And, well, that girl over there, she's always looking out the window to a world where so much is happening. There's so much to explore, to learn, to experience. She's always checked out mentally instead of filling in the little bubbles on her Scantron on these standardized tests. Those children, they don't fit the mold. They're problem students. Maybe, well, maybe they should be medicated. Yeah, medicated. Give them some Ritalin or, hey, Adderall. Medicate them, publicly shame them so they can be normal, so they can be obedient, silent, and still. If they're not obedient, they're of no use to the state. We're seeing this play out now with adults who aren't obedient to the state and its health mandates throughout 2020 and 2021. Look at all the fact checkers on state-sponsored social media. Look at all the fear-mongering stories broadcast across the MSM. If you don't comply, you're the enemy. You're made to question everything you know. Your family will ostracize you like the village idiot if you're not on board. Hey, you're even painted as a domestic terrorist if you post certain things on Facebook, your Facebook friends will report you for extremism. This isn't an episode about public school, but I do have my notes here on public school, and I think it's interesting with the link between school and state being established in pre-Socratic Greece. Back in the day, school was used to mold young boys into obedient warriors with the system promoted and supported by the upper echelon of society. Do y'all remember the movie 300? It came out when I was in high school and I went out on a date and the best part of the date was the movie. (laughs) The company was not it. In the military city-state of Sparta, compulsory schooling was enforced by forcibly taking young boys from their mothers and training them for 12 years under state-controlled supervision. Then we fast forward to the year 1717 when a national public school system was instituted in Europe by the Kingdom of Prussia. But they really kicked it into gear when Prussia was defeated by Napoleon. They blamed the defeat on disobedient soldiers. And in a last-ditch effort to compete with Great Britain and other imperial powers, Prussia increased the state's hold on society, with parents being fined if they failed to send their child to school. And fines are what, class? That's right. Laws for poor people. When you force the children to go to government school, you ensure the state's position as guardian over the children during their key developmental years. And so we have this factory-like system where we have this method of dividing students by age like one would group products by date of manufacture. And these students move through school like an assembly line, with the final product being a predictable and easy-to-control herd, of course. So the origins of public school in the U.S. actually date back to 1647 in Massachusetts. Every time I say Massachusetts on this channel, people are like, you didn't say that correctly. So I just say it a different way every single time. Over there and back then, they had private and decentralized schooling being commonplace as it was the parents' responsibility to provide their child with a basic education. And yeah, in many cases, it was the responsibility of education being shifted from the parents to local communities, which would hire a schoolmaster to teach children to read and write. But that all changed with the Industrial Revolution. When man met machine, agricultural communities went bye-bye and families migrated to the city to find work. The fallout of which was dismantling the family economy, which the family economy used to be really important. But the Industrial Revolution destroyed many small, self-sufficient local communities, and along with that destruction came an ever-growing dependency on this remote authority. There was also an emergence of a new nobility. Industrial titans and family names we still recognize and answer to to this day. Families of big industry like the Carnegies and the Rockefellers, they learned a valuable lesson from history. They realized that the industrial poor who were barely earning a living wage in their warehouses and factories, they were actually the revolutionists of days past. And they knew that in order to maintain the control of their human cattle, their herd needed to be tended to and cultivated. Otherwise, revolution and even worse, competition was inevitable. So, shortly after the Civil War, the Department of Education was established as a federal office, and by 1890, most states had implemented a Prussian-inspired compulsory public school system. 
And of course, the corporate interests had their greasy hands, their greasy paws all over it. This whole new venture, the business of education. Because they figured out that those students, those children, all that potential, while they could mold them into the perfect employee, just as the state had molded students before into the perfect soldier. Remember getting all that homework when you were in school? Hours and hours of homework some nights? Barely enough time to unwind before bed, so it felt like your free time wasn't even your own. Sort of feels similar to the way your manager or boss texts you on your off days or expects you to cover a shift last minute. Like your free time isn't even your own. Like you're just here on this earth to work, consume, and die. And how dare you act depressed about it. Not only that, but think about the 40 hour plus work week. It keeps people willing to consume. So it really lends itself to the corporation. This whole lack of free time means a lot of people, I'm not saying everyone, are looking for that quick dopamine hit of convenience, of relief, of indulgence, or whatever. Those hours outside of an exhausting day are typically not filled with ambition, so it's not like you're going to be inventing things to compete with the corporate interests. For most of us, those hours are used as a means of escape. We fill it with entertainment and we buy things because it feels like we're missing something. So my point here is that corporate interests are all over government school. This whole Rockefeller, Ford, Carnegie foundations, they've joined other corporate juggernauts in their domination of the student's mind. Like the Walton family of the Walmart empire with its talons also in central banking, they've invested over a billion dollars in the education system. And that's only surpassed by the Gates Foundation, who, like the Rockefellers, they not only deal in the alleged eugenics programs disguised as medical research, but they also directly fund Common Core, paying to develop the standards and the tests. Is the Gates Foundation doing that out of the goodness of their hearts? Or do they own a stake in the big data businesses to which the Department of Education directs the bulk of its outsourcing? And think about what kind of influence these people have on our lives and our the way we're taught to question life, question others, question the information that is presented to us. And look at the last year. What the Gates Foundation? Are they wanting you to buy their product without question like they have pushed us to do just in 2021 by rolling up our sleeves and taking a shot? These corporations, just a handful of families, have attempted to normalize behavior. To condition the mind not to see red flashing warning signs when there absolutely should be red flashing warning signs. This morning, I was on Twitter and I saw this article come up on my newsfeed and it's really, it's really unpleasant. So if you don't want to listen about dogs being treated in the most awful ways, just click off. But essentially, the news came out that there's been a bipartisan letter released demanding answers from the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and President Biden's chief medical advisor. Wanting Dr. Fauci to explain why he's brutalizing puppies for research under the supreme moral banner of science. And I'm reading notes here. It says that the White Coat Waste Project, the nonprofit organization that pointed out that, the, that U.S. taxpayers were being used to fund the controversial Wuhan Institute of Virology, have now turned its sights to the, on Anthony Fauci on another animal testing related matter. Infecting dozens of beagles with disease-causing parasites to test an experimental drug on them. According to the White Coat Waste Project, the Food and Drug Administration does not require drugs to be tested on dogs, so the group is asking why the need for such testing. White Coat Waste claims that 44 beagle puppies were used in a Tunisia, North Africa laboratory, and some of the dogs had their vocal cords removed, allegedly so scientists could work without incessant barking. Leading the effort is Representative Nancy Mace, writing a letter to the National Institutes of Health saying that cordectomies are cruel and a reprehensible misuse of taxpayer funds. This project is led by Dr. Fauci, the guy who's been the lead spokesperson for anything corona related, and people essentially live their lives by his advice. If he says no Christmas this year with your family because so-and-so variant, then people will cancel Christmas dinner. 
if he says mask your children even when they sleep so you don't catch a cold from them, you'll have parents masking those children while they sleep. And if he says inject yourself with shots that c- contain aborted baby cells in them, which all the vaccines do, just look it up, even though there are no long-term studies on the effects of doing so with this mRNA vaccine, then people will gladly line up and pull up their sleeves. And if you don't, if you question it, guess what, domestic terrorist? You're crazy. You're just a crazy conspiracy theorist, a danger to us all. But I'm here to tell you, you're not crazy. Society is. I read disturbing stuff all day, every day to make these videos on my channel, but this whole taxpayer-funded puppy torture demonstrates for me that society is absolutely nuts. From start to finish, y'all. You'll have people defending the science in the comment section because they have been conditioned to do so. To defend the actions of their political party, even though serial killers always start with animals first, even though you know as well as I do, that in order to hurt an animal like that, you gotta be so broken. I mean, you're just done as a person. There is no humanity left in you. And if you if you'll torture puppies in the name of science, you don't give a hot damn about the rest of us. You don't care about our children, and you certainly don't care about our health. And you certainly have no problem labeling anyone who calls out your evil a crazy person, a conspiracy theorist, a domestic terrorist, a bigot, a racist, whatever terms you got in that little eugenics bag of yours. And they will call you all this, create all this propaganda, suck out all of this energy from your own tax dollars. So let's come full circle here. From the time most of us are little, what makes us unique is squashed by the system. Instead of giving the best years of your life, your ideas, your creativity, everything you have to your families, your communities, the majority of us have been conditioned to see it as a real achievement to give our best years to corporations who only care about their bottom line. Corporations created by ancient families, by titans of industry who fund programs in government schools so they have generation after generation of good little obedient workers. Workers who maybe show up for work unhappy but doing their best, wondering if they're crazy for not loving what's been made of this American dream. But, you know, ultimately pushing forward so they can provide for their families as the cost of living rises but their wages don't. Inflation rises but their wages don't. With the light at the end of the tunnel being retirement, that freedom for just a little while, and then the seeming finality of death. We have so much potential. We could be so much more. But first, we got to identify what's holding us down so we can break free, so we can stop this cycle because it really, it really doesn't have to be this way. We could have competition. We could have innovation. We could have the American dream. But those people who hold us down who suppress who they see as human cattle, they've properly identified that little spark, that little thing that scares them so much. And they've learned how to squash it, to completely remove it from most of the population by placating them with entertainment, conditioning them, and schooling them out of their own creativity and potential. I actually landed on this topic through doing another video about the Great Resignation a phenomenon occurring across virtually all industries. It was reported last week that in August alone, a record-breaking 4.3 million Americans quit the workforce. Mainly, they're disenchanted and tired of being treated like crap. I suspect a good portion of them have had to quit because of medical mandates. But another portion of folks are just like, this whole way of life isn't working for me. Am I crazy for not for not being satisfied. They told me being a boss bee was supposed to be fun, but it's not fun. It was supposed to be fun, they said, but how do people work for such soulless companies every day of their lives? And I feel the need to say that this is not an anti-work stance I'm putting forth here, not at all. Work is important, labor is important. It's an anti-funneling all of our potential and energy into a broken system. A Babylon debt slavery bee system, really, of crony capitalism and weird evil eugenics like our IG Farben style human experimentation that has merged with government to enforce its monopoly and hold on society. 
Anyway, this episode is for everyone who's ever wondered over the last few years if they were crazy because they noticed the whole grid of the matrix around us. And my answer is no, you're not crazy. Society is. Society is crazy. You're not alone in how you feel. Maybe that's what this podcast is all about. Collectively, we have these thoughts that we don't voice or we rarely voice observations of the world around us, things that aren't quite right, things that we're afraid if we talk about it, we'll be ostracized like the town leper. Yeah, maybe this is the place to let all those things come to light so we don't all feel so alone. That's all I've got for today. Let me know your thoughts. Thank you so much for tuning in, subscribing, and supporting my channel on Patreon. Just so you know, I'm doing these podcasts in addition to regular videos, so you will see more regular videos on my channel. I'm not switching up the content to podcasts only. Talk to you all later. Have a great day. Bye.